After the armistice, the guns went silent across Europe. But not in Berlin, where Germans were fighting Germans. News of the loss by the Fatherland had come as a shock to Berliners. And now, the old order was gone. In its place came chaos. The streets of what was once a quiet, conservative town became free fire zones. The nationalists of the extreme right battling it out with the communists of the extreme left. And out of this struggle emerged a new democratic state, the Weimar Republic. In the 20th century, after the First World War, the world's great metropolis of vice was Berlin. Berlin in the 1920s was the sex capital of Europe. If you knew what to look for, you could find anything, anything known to man in the sexual world was available on the streets of Berlin. On any given night, as many as a hundred thousand prostitutes walked the streets or worked the sex clubs across the city. There were all different whores with um, different kinds of makeup on the street. For instance, one was called Mutsi. Mutsis who were prostitutes who hung out on just one street, Mutstrasse, and these were pregnant prostitutes. There were prostitutes who looked horrible, who, who had acid-scarred faces or hunchbacks or uh, were lame or crippled. These were called grasshoppers. You had mother and daughter teams on one street that dressed exactly alike. Here in Berlin, sex for sale offered every sort of perversion or fetishism imaginable. There was not a sexual appetite that could not be satisfied in this city. There were clubs where lesbians liked to whip schoolboys, and you'd find military officers sitting there with children sitting on their laps. So a lot of it was play acting, but there were quite a lot of people who also indulged in it. Berlin in the 1920s was the sex capital of Europe. Its very name became synonymous with perversion, debauchery, and creativity. Places that you hadn't noticed would turn into outrageous strip clubs. The basements of the restaurants would be homosexual or lesbian romper rooms and sex clubs. Every intellectual was leftish. The whole political right wing, which basically came from Munich, did not play any role in the beginning. The whole town was in the hands of leftish ideas. But outside Berlin, the right wing nationalist movement was attracting scores of disillusioned Germans, including one obscure Austrian corporal by the name of Adolf Hitler. Hitler, like many of the right wingers, hated this new Berlin, a city bursting with Bolsheviks, socialists, revolutionaries, and Jews. But in the early 1920s, Berliners had more immediate concerns. By 1922, inflation was spiraling wildly out of control. People would be paid in the morning and have suitcase fulls of banknotes, and they would have to then run to the shops because in the time between being paid and the time when they bought their goods, their food, the prices would have risen. Berlin was in a state of total, total chaos. Hundreds of thousands of dispossessed starving in the streets. And at the same time, you had very rich people. So you got on the one hand, the poor eating turnip soup, the butchers selling crows, squirrels, even rats. And on the other side, people who could afford it, eating the most sumptuous meals like they never paused for thought. With virtually every currency in the world more valuable than the German mark, foreign tourists flocked into the city to take advantage of the cheapest sex on the continent. Ten dollars in American money could buy you anything you wanted. Every possible sexual taste was catered for. Housefrauls became harlots. 
teenagers turned tricks, and Papa became a pimp. When you have unemployed, you also have an increase in sex workers. But it wasn't just Berliners. It was tens and maybe hundreds of thousands of young boys and young girls who were coming to Berlin to participate in this hard currency um, uh, sex traffic. It was a city that was filled with lesbian life. There was the idea that everywhere you went, you didn't have to hide what you were. When it came to sex, Marlena Dietrich could be omnivorous. As long as she found them attractive, she couldn't care less if her lover was a man or a woman. Dietrich was an omnipotent sexual figure. She was an icon for gay women around the world at a time when there was no one else. With this new anything-goes attitude, Berlin overnight replaced Paris as the center of hedonism. That's why people say Berlin is the Babylon of the 20s. Things that had been considered to be immoral, amoral, whatever, were, were, became irrelevant and anything went. Drugs were readily available in Berlin. Every variety of drug, morphine, cocaine, opium. The morphine and the cocaine you could probably get prescribed by your local doctor or pharmacist. Opium was wildly available and also drugs were used in sexual science. Sexual scientists were very interested in the effects of, for instance, morphine would have on the orgasmic rate of a lesbian. So there was a complete scientific culture. Berlin had become the center of sexual experimentation. It also became the center of scientific research into sex, led by a pioneering doctor. And this was a very funny character called Papa, or the Einstein of sex in Berlin. It was Magnus Hirschfeld. Hirschfeld was a queer, Jewish, social democrat who really defined the liberal spirit of Berlin. The crusading doctor for sexual freedom was also the founder of the world's first institute devoted to the scientific study of sex. You could go and uh, look at various fetish items. For example, he had these trousers that if you wore a trench coat, you could walk around Berlin. It looked like you had pants on because the, the lower parts of the trousers were there, but then you had nothing on uh, above them, and you could flash this way. This was thought to be uh, very titillating, very uh, amusing. So it was this sort of thing you could, you could, you could see in the Institute for Sexual uh, Research. Unlike his fellow doctor in Vienna, Sigmund Freud, Hirschfeld advocated the radical notion that human sexuality could be studied without imposing moral judgments. Hirschfeld's also credited with the operations and surgeries of sex change and sexual rejuvenation. He had a clinic for people to be consulted about sexual problems. But Berlin's reputation as a hotbed for the new and risque was not just limited to its bars and bedrooms. They also streamed into the city streets and clubs of Berlin. From all across Europe, artists, writers and intellectuals with homosexual leanings were drawn to this metropolis. Berlin was unquestionably the most open gay city in the world. It attracted uh, first W.H. Auden, the great British poet, and then his friend Christopher Isherwood. Auden came first, was interested in the gay scene there, and talked about Berlin being a bugger's paradise. Christopher Isherwood, fed up with Cambridge and an England openly hostile to homosexuals, chose to move to Berlin. His novels about the wild side of life in the city and its cabarets were eventually turned into a hugely successful stage play and movie. There were about 160 completely different lesbian and gay male nightclubs and lounges. Unlike most cities, with their one red-light district, Berlin's erotic clubs were scattered throughout the vast metropolis. Bizarre sexual fantasies of domination 
were turned into works of art. While they would indulge in a wide variety of strange sexual experiments involving violence and death, all in the name of art. In 1928, a Nazi propaganda sheet denounced Berlin as a melting pot of everything that is evil. When Goebbels got off the train in 1926 to take over the city, he found the Nazis could scrape together maybe 200 members. And the communists at that point had about 250,000. And they didn't particularly take to a group of people who came in from outside and said that everything that the city had stood for was all of a sudden to be abandoned or to be considered decadent or to be pushed aside. Hitler had personally appointed him to go to Berlin. It looked at the time like an impossible mission. He was a good choice for the Nazis because he understood the city. It was he who was designated to turn the city from a bastion of communism, a red city, into a brown one, that is a bastion of the Nazis. This was a difficult proposition. Berlin, to them, was foreign territory. They shared the typical provincial conservative Germans' uh, notion about Berlin as a decadent place. It was too avant-garde. They hated the place. Berlin was in an upheaval. Street fights were common. Unemployment was worsening. And then, on January 30th, 1933, Hitler was appointed Chancellor of Germany. He made it clear what his plans for the city were. What is ugly in Berlin, we shall remove. What happened in 33, especially, was that the Gay Berlin dive bars started to be raided. Those things had allowed, were allowed to kind of exist under the radar for uh, up until 1933 really the nazi police started paying attention to the dive bars they were harassing the customers they were closing them down you might get arrested the el dorado home to some of the most famous transvestites in the city was taken over and turned into nazi headquarters and goebbels sang out the name of every book because it was consigned to the flames legend has it The exodus was almost immediate. Bertolt Brecht and Kurt Weill, George Gross, Albert Einstein, Marlene Dietrich, just a small number of the thousands who were driven into exile. Berlin, for a short 14 years, had been a crucible of history, brimming with a volatile mix of sex, arts and politics laced with disillusionment and spiked with decadence. The Babylon on the River Spree was no more. 